Good morning, everyone. It's great to finally be back. Tax season's over. Till next year. <laughs> Our call to worship this morning is from the book of Psalms, the 103rd Psalm, verses 11 through 14, and that's found on page 543 of the Church Bible. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your loving kindness. You know our human frailties. We are but dust. We are weak. But we get strength from you and from our belief in your Son every day. And we pray that we all continue to grow in our faith and receive your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. That's a great prayer, Bill. Thank you for that. Good morning, church. Uh, please turn off your cell phones if you haven't done so already. Greatly appreciate that. Uh, any first-time visitors with us? Oh, hey, George. Hey, great to see you, brother. How you doing? Yeah, all right. George is a great guy. George works for Package Town Courier, uh, the business that I have. Okay, uh, let me see, very, very quickly. Uh, so we, um, we had a great turnout, by the way, for the, um, um, the Jonathan Kahn and Glenn Beck interview. Uh, and again, I, I saw that years ago, very, very interesting. If, uh, I know some of you probably couldn't make it, uh, but if you are interested in still watching it, you can dial it up on YouTube. And I think it's uh, episode 182 or something like that. But if you could, Search YouTube, it'll, uh, you'll come up with it. Uh, okay, so this coming Wednesday, we're going to begin a study in the book of James. A uh, great, great book. Uh, also, after church today, we have uh, discipleship um, in the other building. Uh, reminder about Harvest Supple, Supper, sign up. Uh, we're encouraging you to invite people, friends, family that are unchurched or unbelieving. Um, and sometimes they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, but um, anyway, and make sure you, you do the sign-up sheet. Um, also, uh, on the back of the bulletin, I just wanted to highlight this uh, specifically. Somebody had approached me asking me where we were at with uh, the Sanctuary Project Fund. And so uh, I put this together uh, based on the information that Sandy gave me. Uh, kind of gives you a point of reference, but we're almost like one-third um, through paying off uh, that $30,000 loan. So uh, we'll try to put this information in the bulletin once a month so you can kind of uh, see where we're at visually, like with some sort of visual. And I don't know, maybe we perhaps can get like a poster and put it in the back foyer as well. Uh, so, Okay, anything else uh, this morning for the good of the congregation? Anything else? <laughs> yeah, Jerry. And what, what would it be if you didn't have an announcement? <laughs> Where would we be without your announcements? <laughs> um, anyway, just a reminder, today is the last Sunday that we're collecting for school supplies. Um, the, the pencil box in the back, and that is to be split between uh, Walking in Light and Boston Project Ministries. So if you want to put a financial donation in that box, today's the last day. And then also, just a reminder to church members, those um, church service forms for 2024 should be returned to Heidi, Jackie, or myself either today or hopefully by next Sunday. And um, even if you can't serve, some of you serve in other capacities that are not on that sheet or you're just not able to, just please sign it and return it to us because that helps us just keep track, okay? Thank you. I am so thankful I don't have to make all the announcements. I, I really am. A different voice is always helpful. Uh, okay, uh, anything else for the good of the congregation? All right, our next song, uh, hymn number 510, Heaven Came Down. Please stand.
Our tithes and offering verse this morning is from the book of Acts, the 20th chapter, verse 35. That begins on page 1001. In everything I showed you, that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to give into your ministry, into the good works of this ministry. Bless our and multiply our giving today and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Folks, you know that we have a great God. I think that's why you're here today. I think you understand that. Um, He cares. Uh, Nothing too great or too small is beyond the scope of his touching and his measure uh, to address. And um, we're burdened by a lot of cares and concerns. Uh, Me too. Not only you. I say we. uh, It happens, right? But um, God knows. God cares. uh, Loves us so, so much. Um, Let's boldly come before his throne of grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for your eternal presence. And even though we cannot see you, um, We know and believe with all of our hearts you're in this place. You inhabit the praise of your people. You come along the side of your people. You indwell your people. And um, all across the world, you have a people that seek your face and a people that believe in the word of God and the holy scriptures that are able to make us wise unto salvation. Uh, We're just a a local community here, and yet there's communities all across this country, local churches, that are worshiping you in spirit and in truth. And that's our desire this morning, Lord, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. And uh, we pray that all of the cares... um, 
the concerns um, that we have, the burdens that are upon our heart. And Lord, there are many. There, there are so, so many. Um, and we can't even articulate the number of them, nor would we even begin to share with our brothers and sisters in Christ just for fear of um, seeming weak and uh, frail and um, double-minded or shaky in the faith. Uh, but all of us have those uh, concerns and those fears, and you know them completely. And uh, my prayer, Lord, uh, this morning, uh, for each and every one of us that the cares of the world would not choke out the word of God when we hear it, um, that we would have ears to hear and a heart uh, to receive uh, when we hear your word, uh, and great uh, humility and um, a, a spirit, uh, a heart, Lord, that just desires to put you first. I, I think of the wonderful, wonderful scripture I've been reading the last couple of days, seek the Lord and his strength, Seek his face continually, and Lord, that's what we want to do, and uh, we're so frail. Um, we get so displaced in that quest and in our heart's desires, and yet um, you, um, you, you always dwell and you visit uh, those who are lowly of heart, and we pray uh, that we would be lowly of heart and humble ourselves this morning, uh, that you might uh, lift us up under your mighty hand. Um, Father, I, I pray for our country, uh, great, great needs in our country, great, great needs uh, from every level of government, um, local, state, national. Um, tremendous needs in every family. And we pray for a great revival. Uh, Lord, we uh, des so desperately need it, and nothing happens apart from you. And um, we just pray that you would pour out your spirit on our nation and our leaders, our churches. Father, I pray uh, for Israel during this time and the peace of Jerusalem. And also, Father, too, uh, so many, many uh, people in the Middle East that are unbelieving. Um, we thank you that your word is being, being beamed into places by way of satellite and radio uh, uh, to reach the Muslim world. And uh, thank you that your word never returns void. Uh, that's true as it's beamed into Muslims' countries, and it's true as it's uh, preached here or in every place uh, throughout uh, the world. We thank you that your word doesn't return void. Um, we uh, don't want to fail to mention uh, Keith Johnson this morning in Morton Hospital, encourage his heart and bring healing to his foot where the toe has been amputated. Um, encourage Mickey and may his heart just be so fixed and set on you. Um, um, thank you for the spirit that you've given Edie Jackson uh, what a blessing when uh, she just smiles and um, uh, talks about you being by her side and uh, being with her every step of this trial. Uh, bless her heart. Uh, think of Jerry, Lord, and the need to uh, sell his home, and we pray for where he's placed as he uh, moves from uh, the current facility, and may he uh, always sense your presence and Father, uh, last but not least, I think of Dave. Uh, prepare him mentally, emotionally, and physically for the upcoming surgery uh, at the end of the month and give him great, great strength physically um, to be able to recuperate from the liver surgery to remove the cancer. Um, we're, you're so good. Uh, you're so wonderful and loving, kind to each and every one of us. And we pray that you would uh, that uh, you would visit us in a very special way, and uh, that each heart here this morning uh, would sense the holy presence of God in their life and in this place. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, uh, we have a scripture reading, Rachel. Right,
Our first scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 8, and that's found on page 970. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks, Bill. Okay, so um, I need another favorite this morning. Our second scripture reading this morning is also from the New Testament, from the letter of James, the beginning of the letter of James. Sorry about that, ladies. I wasn't sure if you were coming down or not. (laughs) So again, it's from the letter of James first chapter, verses 1 through 8, and that's found on page 1091. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let the endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously, without reproach, and it will be given to him. 
But he must ask in faith, without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. This is the word of our Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, give us ears to hear, uh, hearts to receive, and um, ask that you would give uh, life um, to the words that I share and what you've laid upon my heart. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So folks, uh, last week we talked about perseverance in trials. Uh, This morning I want to revisit James and talk about having joy in trials. Now, I want you to notice that James mentions joy before he mentions perseverance. Now some of you might think, well gee, he preached on perseverance last week, now he's preached, did he have the cart before the horse, right? Did you you ever see the picture about the cart before the horse? There's this wonderful picture where the guy standing with the cart, there's no horse in front of him, the horse is behind, and the horse is like looking almost like off to the side of a crowd, and it's like, go figure, right? The horse is like, if the horse had arms, it would be like, go figure. But the guy's all set and ready to go, and he's oblivious to the fact that the horse is behind him, right? Um, so. Uh, it's, it's funny because, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of like a cartoon uh, uh, or a picture, but animals are kind of instinctive, aren't they? They have a basic sense uh, when something is not right, and yet a lot of times as people, you know, um, we don't always have that, that sense. So uh, you might be wondering, well, why then did I preach on perseverance last week? Simply because I was led to do so. Uh, and I'm led to speak on joy this morning. So, uh, yes, I put the cart before the horse, but it's because I was led to do so. First and foremost, joy comes before perseverance in trials. And that's why James starts with joy. And, and joy needs to come before perseverance. Last week I said that perseverance is the fruit or the end result of a trial, But joy is the first fruits of any trial. And if I use this analogy, joy uh, to the Christian is like sap to a tree. It's life-giving. It's life-sustaining. It's life-altering. And it's actually trial-altering when we go through it. Joy makes perseverance possible. That's why it comes first. I have been in pastoral ministry since 1985, and I wish that I could say that every single time I've come into the pulpit that I own what I preach on. That's like saying, hey, every time you buy a lottery ticket, you hit the lottery. Or that's like saying, hey, every time a baseball player gets up to bat, he hits a home run. It doesn't happen, folks. It's unrealistic. The reality is this, this is my personal experience, if I own something when I preach on it, I'm tested and tried with it that upcoming week as to whether I actually own it or put it into practice. And if I don't own it, then I'm presented with putting it into practice that week anyway. And, you know, I used to sit where you folks sit, and I do sit where you folks sit when I go on vacation, And I know what it means to sit in the pew. And when you hear something, whether we own it or not, or we're challenged to own it, we're still confronted with having to put it into practice, right? And so my my point in all this is that joy in trials is something that's very, very difficult to own. Amen? 
It's difficult to own, but it's possible. Now, I wish that I could say 100% of the time that I've always had joy in the midst of trials. I haven't. I wish I did, but I haven't. But when I've had it, I can tell you that it's a sweetness to the soul like nothing else on planet Earth. Uh, more recently, I, I got some sobering business news about potentially losing some customers. And one is a very, very big customer. And when I heard the news, God gave me great, great peace, great joy. It's like, you know, God, whatever you want to do, right, your will be done. I knew God was doing something. He's always doing something. So I was at peace, and I was content, and I had great joy. But not long after that, the joy kind of like, you know, just flew out the window. The peace went out the window. The contentment went out the window. Now, how did that happen? It's because in my humanness, I shifted and gravitated, my mind shifted and gravitated from what the fact that God was doing something, knowing he was doing something, and having great concern for how it would affect me and other people financially. And that's how it works, right? And so I went from joy in my spirit to a knot in my stomach. Do you ever have a knot in your stomach? You go from, and literally, you know, you, from here to there, in, in a, and it can be in a nanosecond, but it, but it happens naturally, uh, unfortunately. Too often than we'd like to admit. Uh, Billy Sunday, a great American evangelist back in the day said, I love this quote, if you have no joy, there's a leak in your Christianity somewhere. <laughs> John, you're a plumber, right? You know about leaks, right? Everybody's had leaks in plumbing. Everybody's had leaks in their Christianity. Just part and parcel of it, right? And, and so James's idea here of joy in the midst of trials is a radical concept. Right? But it's thoroughly a Christian concept. It's not something that you find in the world. The world knows nothing of the sort of having joy in trials. Uh, there was a gentleman by the name of S.D. Gordon, a man involved in the YMCA in the late 19th and 20th centuries. He said, quote, joy is distinctively a Christian word and a Christian thing. It is the reverse of happiness. Happiness is the result of what happens of an agreeable sort. Joy has its springs deep down inside. And that spring never runs dry no matter what happens. Only Jesus gives that joy. He had joy singing its music within, even under the shadow of the cross. Yeah, the Lord Jesus was very, very joyful under the shadow of the cross. Uh, Hebrews 12, 2, for the joy set before him enjoyed, endured the cross. Jesus referred to this joy of soul as in John chapter 4, is living water, a wellspring unto eternal life. Now, we know that he was talking about himself because Christ is the joy giver. And when we receive him, we have the Holy Spirit that lives within our heart. And therefore, we have the potential to manifest joy in the spirit. Uh, it comes from a person. It comes from a relationship with God. Uh, Peter spoke of Holy Spirit joy in 1 Peter 1.9 as joy unspeakable or inexpressible. If you know the joy that I'm talking about, it's unspeakable and inexpressible. It's supernatural. It's divine. And it's the kind of joy that gets us through life and hardships and keeps us from becoming parched and withered on the vine. That's the kind of joy I'm talking about, where you're, you're divinely rejuvenated. Uh, Johnny Erickson Tata referred to Holy Spirit joy like supernatural effervescence, bubbling up 
and leading up to spontaneous praise. So when, when James says, consider it all joy, notice here that it's, it's actually a command. It's an order. It's, it, 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 if you get into the grammar, it's in the imperative mood for those of you who love grammar. But it's a command. And, 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 it's, and, and, he, and he orders us to find that. Uh, the, the word for consider actually means to take into account or to take inventory or to take the lead. And, 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 and what he's, if I can translate it, he's basically saying, let joy take the lead in the trial. Uh, in other words, consider what joy will do and how it helps us in our trials. And I can tell you personally that joy in the midst of trial changes attitude and it changes outlook. And, it, and, it, and what happens is it comes by harnessing the mind of Christ. Because if we have Christ, we have his mind. It doesn't always mean that we harness his mind, but we have his mind. And so joy is intended and designed to change our attitude and our outlook so we don't become like the world, miserable, um, parched, dried up, and have no hope. And so the joy here, it's not for the trial, but it's joy in the trial. And so this is my personal experience, that when, when we acknowledge that God's at work, when we submit to the Lordship of Christ, when we defer to him, when we find rest to our souls in what he's doing, and we seek to bring every thought captive, then the joy of the Lord bubbles up and overwhelms, just wells up in the soul. It swells up. Uh, C.H. Spurgeon wrote, uh, when the heart is full of joy, it always allows its joy to escape. It is like the fountain in the marketplace, Whenever it is full, it runs away in streams, and so soon as it ceases to overflow, you may be quite sure that it has ceased to be full. Uh, only the full heart is the overflowing heart. Uh, what, what a wonderful analogy. A fountain in the marketplace. Huh? You know, um, I've, I've shared this personally uh, from time to time, Sunday school, maybe even corporately. But uh, a number of years ago, I was really, really going through a very, very difficult time in ministry. And I did not have much joy. And I didn't say much to people. Uh, but at the time, as I distinctly remember, I had a sinful and ungrateful heart. It's not a good place to be. And I was fighting God and I was kicking and screaming, you know, uh, kind of like the little kid that, you know, you see it sometimes in the mall with mom and dad. And I was kicking and screaming and I was, I was in one of those deep, deep spiritual ruts and it was getting deeper. And, and, and so I didn't say much to anybody. I don't recall saying much to my wife. I kept it to myself. So I thought. So after a service one Sunday morning, Jane Campbell, I love your wife, Bob. I know you love her more. Jane's like a sister. She's just incredible. Jane pulls me aside, and right on the front steps there, the old front steps, she said, Jerry, remember the joy of the Lord is your strength. I didn't have to say anything. Jane could look at me, and I was joyless. That's a terrible, terrible place to be. It talk about uh, getting smacked right here, but it was a good smack. And I'm, I always remember that. I will always remember what Jane said to me. I will take it to my grave. Never forget. Very, very thankful and grateful for what she said. And so this is what I've learned. The joy of the Lord is such that it can rise, and it does, it can and rise and fall on perspective. 
If we have a sinful, ungrateful heart and we say, well, God's taken something away from me, or he's going to do that, as opposed to accepting what he wants to do, then we start to go down that path of an ungrateful and sinful heart. And James is telling us that God's doing something, right, in a trial. You know, it's kind of funny. So when I was, when I was preparing this, I'm thinking, you know, uh, how many times do we rejoice when we hear, oh, you know, God saves somebody. Uh, that's answered prayer, right? Or God answers a prayer that we've been praying for somebody, family member, friend, church member, right? And we're so excited because he actually answers the prayer in the way that we prayed. We're so excited, right? But when he sends a trial our way, are we excited? Oftentimes we're sourpuss, right? Because we don't like it. We bemoan it, we complain, we grumble, and we go kicking and screaming. And yet, Scripture's telling us that God is changing us, and he's proving our faith, and he's creating something very, very special. And yet we go kicking and screaming. I mean, it's, it's amazing. When we're in, the, the, in between the rock and the hard place, when we're struggling personally and spiritually, not only do we not rejoice, we lose that edge in perspective. Been there, done that. And so what happens is rather than embracing the joy of the Lord as our strength, we embrace every single human emotion on planet Earth, across the spectrum. And I mentioned that. Somebody, somebody might say, well, you know, Pastor, the, you know, embracing emotions and hardship, and uh, that's just grieving, and that's just going through. Yeah, I, I understand that. You want to be human, right? But this is my experience. When I've embraced my emotions and my hardship, and all of the things like, uh, you know, I start to pout, and I start to, you know, to be human, so to speak, I find that oftentimes it displaces the joy of the Lord. Because I want to embrace my human motions and all my feelings over here, I'm suppressing the Holy Spirit here. That's my personal experience. It doesn't always happen, but, you know, sometimes there's tears of joy. But because we're wallowing in the spectrum of human emotions, we often push the Holy Spirit joy down. And so... Every, every single believer has the Holy Spirit joy within. It's the fruit of the Spirit. The question is this, is Holy Spirit joy in the trial? That's the question. Have we allowed him, the Lord, to spiritually engage the trial? Because he sent it in the first place, right? And, and that's the challenge for each and every one of us. And what your trials are, are not my trials. And what my trials aren't, are maybe not our neighbors, but God has sent the trials. And, and it's important to accept the challenge, to engage in the challenge, and as James says here, to consider it all joy. Take, take a look at verse 12 uh, outside the scripture reading uh, this morning. This is one of the very first verses as a believer that I remember uh, memorizing. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. One of, one of the very first scriptures I memorized. <laughs> I should have actually memorized verse 2 before verse 12. Because uh, to count it all joy or consider it all joy would have served me way better when I, if I had Holy Spirit joy in all the trials that I've been dealt. And I've been dealt a lot of trials. And uh, I don't know, I guess maybe as you get older, maybe you have more trials. I don't know. Earlier in the message, I said we're here to have joy in the trial, not for the trial. And that's a huge distinction. And God is not encouraging us to embrace a masochistic spirit. Hey, Lord, give me more trials. Doesn't work that way. God's encouraging us by proving our faith in the trial. Uh, if, you, if you were to take, uh, if you go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, it's the Lord's Prayer of the Our Father. And Jesus taught us to pray, and lead us not in temptation, into temptation or trial. It's the same word 
in James as it is in Matthew in the Lord's Prayer. And so we're not to pray for the trials. We're to pray that we're not led into the trials. Uh, we are to pray that we're delivered from evil. And sometimes those are evil trials. <laughs> I mean, evil just sometimes seems to find us, right? And, and so uh, God's not asking us to pray for more trials. The, the other thing I want to point out here uh, about joy James starts with the first, it's because it's foundational to making the most of every trial. Uh, it sets the table for the other things to follow. For faith to properly seize the moment, it gives rise to the fruit of perseverance. And out of all this, James even mentions that wisdom can take root if we ask for it. Think about this for a moment. The joy of the Lord will affect faith more than faith will affect joy. And the joy of the Lord will affect perseverance more than perseverance will affect joy. And so that's why it comes first. And the joy of the Lord affects attitude and outlook and acceptance of trials more than faith and perseverance combined. And that's why it's foundational. To any trial. The other thing here too, uh, it, there's no secret, but the, the joy in trials is strength to the persevering and faith-filled soul. King David in Psalm 28 verses 7 and 8 wrote, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy and I will give thanks to him in song. Notice the correlation between strength, strength and joy. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Nehemiah says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And such strength helps us to find faith when we need faith most. And such strength and joy helps us to find perseverance when we need perseverance most. And without the joy of the Lord and his strength, we wouldn't find faith nor perseverance. And so that's why it's foundational to any trial. Got to have, gotta have joy in a trial, folks. Now, I may have started, uh, you know, I may have put the cart before the horse uh, last week, you know, perseverance before joy. But I'm absolutely convinced that... Uh, through the cart and the horse analogy, I'm absolutely convinced that you will always remember that joy is necessary and foundational to every other thing in a trial. I'm totally convinced of that. Uh, because joy is very much like the horse. It pulls the cart. It pulls the trial. Anyway, that's what God has uh, laid upon my, my heart this morning. Perseverance is huge, faith is huge, but you got to have joy in the trial, folks. Uh, and that's something that the world can never have. That's something that God's given us the ability to have. Um, let's, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for giving us everything for life and godliness, and thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit uh, uh, to be always by our side, to never leave us nor forsake us, Lord. And as we go through trials that are sent our way, uh, thank you uh, that you have given us the opportunity to have fruit uh, and joy in trial. And um, we, um, it, it's like a bomb. It's for healing. Uh, it's to pull the cart. Um, it's a holy fire to keep us going. And um, thank you, Lord, that um, it's often uh, sown in broken ground. Um, joy is often sown um, in, in broken ground. And uh, so may we uh, take the scripture to heart. Uh, may we trust you. May we find acceptance. May we uh, embrace any challenges or difficulties and hardships that are sent our way. 
uh, understanding that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, being with a blessed people this morning, your people. And thank you, Lord, that you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think in any trial or in any circumstance or any situation in which we find ourselves. And to God be the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, go figure. Look at this. 541, the joy of the Lord. 541. Please stand. <laughs> 